people in the ball. And the other thing is, it used to be said that if you were in spread punt formation, a man coming off the corner could not get there. But that's when a guy used to be able to run only, say, a 4-6. Now they put guys that run 4-4 coming off that corner, and they can get there, especially when there's a variance in the handling of the ball or, or the center snap. And they can get there, and they proved it on us, and they proved it on about every other team. The most natural scapegoat is the punter. Yet, as the Giants' Dave Jennings noted, kickers do not control their own destiny. I think that most kickers are at the mercy of the special teams because uh, I, as a punter, have two seconds to get the punt off. So when the snap comes back to me, I don't have a chance to sit up and look at the guys coming in. If I do, the punt will be blocked. I have to get it off as quickly as possible. I'd say 90% of blocked kicks are because of a missed block. Uh, a player who did not execute his assignment properly, a mistake by the kicking team. That's 90% of the time. We get good field position, or we get our team out of poor field position. When you have a blocked punt, well, you've got about a 50-yard change in field position, and that can have an effect on the rest of the game. While many clubs have only discovered the benefits of blocking punts this season, the Minnesota Vikings and linebacker Matt Blair have always known the value of spiking punts. It gives the defensive offensive team a chance to you know, regroup and uh, get more enthused about you know, the next play, you know, uh, we can you know, do this, we can do that. And it gives you confidence in the punting aspect of you try to pick out a point. I try to get it when the ball is just about maybe a yard from the ground when he lifts his leg, you know, kicking it. And you try to get your hands up and try to block it. It's timing. In many situations since I've been here, we've blocked when we need it. It's something that we just knew at uh, times that we had to do it uh, to win the game. No play in football can alter the complexion of a game faster than a blocked punt, for it is a strategy with minimal risk and maximum rewards. One other thing you need are guts to go in there, right? <laughs> the time, though, Jimmy. And let's run down the rest of the bowl schedule for everybody. The Liberty Bowl next weekend, LSU and Missouri. Jimmy, who's the favorite here? Missouri by a touchdown. Now the Sun Bowl, Maryland against the Longhorns of Texas. The Texans a touchdown. The Tangerine Bowl, North Carolina State and Pittsburgh. Should we say Pittsburgh by a light touchdown? Why not? The Fiesta Bowl matches Arkansas and UCLA Christmas Day. Arkansas, another light touchdown. And another Christmas Day bowl game, Purdue, Georgia Tech and Atlanta's Peach Bowl. Purdue, a field goal. The Gator Bowl, Clemson against Ohio State. Brent, this is a toss-up, but there's some dissension among the Clemson players. Blue Bonnet Bowl, it's Stanford and Georgia. Stanford by a touchdown. The Cotton Bowl. Houston against Notre Dame. In a real high scoring game, Notre Dame a field goal. The Sugar Bowl, Penn State, Alabama. I wish I could pick it, it's a toss up. The Rose Bowl, Southern California and Michigan. The Trojans by a touchdown. And the Orange Bowl, the Revenge Bowl if you prefer, Nebraska and Oklahoma. Oklahoma right under two touchdowns. Prior to the start of today's Washington-Chicago game, we hooked up Jim Finks, the general manager of the Chicago Bears, and I asked him if Neil Armstrong will be back next year as coach. Pushed by the Rams the next night. But when L.A. lost to Cincinnati, the Cowboys were still in the running. Both teams now have 11-4 and four records, and if they should finish the season tied, L.A. would claim the home side advantage because they beat Dallas earlier this year. While the Cowboys and Rams have big games tomorrow to determine who gets to play in front of their hometown fans, five teams are in a struggle just to make the playoffs at all, so their games are even more crucial. The Packers, who will play the Rams tomorrow, are one of the three teams that can determine their own fate. Despite losing to the Bears last week, if Green Bay beats L.A. tomorrow, they'll qualify for the playoffs either as a wildcard team or as Central Division champions. Right now, the Packers and the Vikings are tied for the division lead, and though the Vikings got beaten badly by the Detroit Lions last week, Minnesota can still clinch the Central Division title by beating the Raiders tomorrow. Meanwhile, two of three teams that cannot win division titles can make the playoffs as wildcard teams. Last week, the Atlanta Falcons took a big step toward the playoffs by bumping the Washington Redskins. If Atlanta can stop St. Louis tomorrow, the Falcons will clinch a wild card entry into the postseason. Washington and Philadelphia are not so fortunate. They simply must win and hope for help from other teams. If Philadelphia can repeat its incredible victory over the Giants again tomorrow, the Eagles will still have a chance to make the playoffs. 
The same holds true for the Redskins, who will still be alive if they top Chicago today. So we've talked about some of the great receivers in the game. We talked about Bambi, Lance Allworth. We talked about the big, strong guy, Otis Taylor. Today we talk about another receiver in that class, number 42, Mr. Paul Warfield. The man alongside me, a very familiar face, not only on the football field, but now in the broadcast booth as well as an NBC broadcasting cohort, Paul Warfield, and we're going to go back to the fall of 1971 of the Orange Bowl, Miami and Pittsburgh. Why that game? Why does that one stand out, Paul? Well, it was a ball game in which the Miami Dolphins really came of age, I thought, in the National Football League. A lot of people thought we were pretenders, but uh, we played a fine football team from Pittsburgh that day. We were down by a score of 21 nothing in the first quarter, and we were able to come back and win the game. Does there just come a point where a team takes an attitude that we're going to win this thing, we are winners, no longer losers? Barry, the Miami Dolphins were a young football team in 1971. We were just learning to win consistently. We were playing a fine team from Pittsburgh that afternoon, and they were established winners. And we met some adversity that afternoon. We conquered it, went on to win the football game, and that sort of set the map for us to go on to win in future years. Nobody was speaking of the Miami dynasty in 1971 when the Dolphins took the field against the Pittsburgh Steelers. It was an almost team for the past couple of years. There were a couple of pieces still missing. True enough, there was Larry Sanka and Jim Kick to carry the football, and there was quarterback Bob Greasy to throw the ball when he absolutely had to. The pass at Miami was a surprise element with folks like Sanka and Kick to carry the ball. Editor Paul Warfield from Cleveland, and in this game, it all came together. The Dolphins promptly got themselves 21-3 behind the Steelers, who were a coming team themselves. But then Greasy and Warfield for 86 yards on this play, touchdown Miami. And the Dolphins trailed by just four, 21 to 17. And once again, the team that lived by the ground won by the pass. Greasy, utilizing his running backs to set up the picture play action pass. The man on the other end, Paul Warfield. And the Dolphins were a winner. Warfield added that dimension that Miami needed. On that team, he made Larry Sanka a more effective running back. He made Jim Kick effective to the outside. And he made Bob Greasy realize the potential that had been latent. That pass was still not something the Dolphins would use a great deal. But when they did, it was devastating. When the dust had cleared in this game, the Dolphins were the winners. Paul Warfield was the hero. And the Super Bowl super teams were born. Paul, a little bit different perspective for you now, watching your game from up here rather than down on the sidelines. Yes, it is a little bit different. I get a chance to see the full view of the field, whereas before, everything was happening right in front of me. But uh, I sort of enjoy it up here. Is it difficult to take a step back from it rather than being involved in it? No, not really, because I had a full career, and uh, I retired right at the right time, 13 years after starting. Was it a difficult thing to say to yourself, now is the time for me to get out? It must be very difficult for an athlete to, to tell himself when he can still play the game. Well, no. As I said, I had a full career. I played with three championship teams, one here in Cleveland, two down in Miami, and that's what every player wants, to play for a championship team and to get one of these rings right here. If you had to do it all over again, would you do it any different? I wouldn't do it any differently. Start with Cleveland, go to Miami, and then come back to Cleveland. Paul, thanks very much for taking the time to be with us. Sure. Greatest of the great. And for NBC, I'm Barry Tompkins. Now let's turn our attention. He has today's NFL highlight.